Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the last session of the RFS Leadership Webinar Series. Uh, my name is Monica Yuseda. I'm a vascular and intervention radiology fellow at Medical College of Wisconsin and past um, RFS Woman in IR Chair. Over the course of 10 months, uh, several leaders in our field presented their perspective on different leadership topics, including negotiation skills, networking, teamwork, work-life balance, etc. Um, this program was developed by myself and uh, supporting colleagues who collaborated in organizing and coordinating the sessions. We're very grateful to all the wonderful speakers and hope the series has contributed to um, the participants' career development. I would like to thank uh, the Communications Committee and especially one of our members, Alex Kutsenko, Dr. Kutsenko, who co-created and helped me organize all this series. So thank you very much, Alex, for all what um, you did for us and for um, this program. Tonight, four of the most influential individuals in our field will share their experiences in leadership. Um, Susan Sidori um, is the Executive Director of the Society of Intervention Radiology, CEO of the Society of Intervention Radiology Foundation and the Treasurer of the IVC Filter Study Group Foundation. She holds a master's degree in speech science from the University of Maryland and has authored and presented more than 50 peer-reviewed papers her certified association executive designation in 2008 and has more than 30 years of management and research experience in nonprofit, corporate and federal government sectors. Um, James Beninati is the medical director of the Peripheral Vascular Laboratory Liar Fellowship Program Director at the Miami Cardiac and Vascular Institute and clinical associate professor of radiology at the University of South Florida. He completed his radiology residency at Indiana University Medical Center and Fellowship in Cardiovascular and Intervention Radiology at Johns Hopkins. He has held offices in several societies, including the American Heart Association and Radiologic, um, Radiological Society of North America. He's past president of the Society of Intervention Radiology and received the Charles Dodder Award in 2014. Maureen Kohi is an associate professor of clinical radiology and chief of intervention radiology at the University of California, San Francisco. Dr. Kohi received her medical degree from New York Medical College with honors and completed her diagnostic radiology residency as well as her IR fellowship at UCSF, followed by a second fellowship in women's imaging at the same institution. She has held many leadership positions and is now the incoming chair of the SIR Women in IR Committee. Prak Patel is an associate professor of radiology and surgery and program director of the integrated and independent intervention radiology programs at the Medical College of Wisconsin. He completed his radiology residency at Loyola University in Chicago and IR fellowship at the Baptist Cardiac and Vascular Institute in Miami. He has served on several committees in the Society of Intervention Radiology, including the IR Residency Implementation Task Force, APDIR, and Executive Council as GME Division Counselor. Most recently, he has been appointed SIR Secretary and will become President of the Society of Intervention Radiology in 2022. Um, as you can see, we gathered a very good panel uh, very influential and important people in our field. Um, each panelist will briefly share their experiences or challenges in leadership positions. We will then open the mic to the audience for questions. Um, thank you very much. We are extremely grateful. Without further ado, please welcome our panel. Thank you. So would you like to start? So I might be, I'd be happy to start. Yep. Good, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Sue Sidori, and as Alex said, I'm the executive director at SIR. And as the only non-physician on this panel, um, my story is probably going to sound a lot different than everyone else's, but I, I really want to make sure that I'm here to help make sure everybody know how they can actually get involved. And you're going to have to beg my indulgence, but my dog is actually being very needy right now. So you may hear her growl or bark every once in a while. Um, coming at the association world from a slightly different perspective, I um, was involved when I was a student uh, in the American Speech and Hearing Association, much like many of you residents or um, medical students are probably involved in, in SIR. And over those years of just coming to meetings and engaging and, and wanting to be more and more involved, you just sort of learn that there's an opportunity if you seek it, that you can um, do more to present, to volunteer, to be on committees and find an opportunity to engage. For me, it was really quite interesting because I ultimately went to work for um, the American Academy of Otolaryngology, which was one of the places I had presented at. 
and, and found myself in this very strange place of being both a staff person and, and having been involved with the organization. And from there, I really embraced a number of different ways to get involved as I grew my career. And I think the key successes that I've always found in leadership is that you really want to make sure that you um, have a focus on what you want, but not to the exclusion of other things. A great leader, I think, is one who can inspire people to come along with the story that they create and, and really think about what you're trying to accomplish when you're trying to transform yourself. And I really um, enjoy being able to do that at the SIR. I think we have a really unique opportunity as an organization to both give individuals a chance to thrive and be leaders, as well as collectively work together to see the organization thrive and be leaders. Now that always comes with challenges. I mean, you, 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 uh, we're challenged to find time for people to be involved. We're challenged to make sure our voice is heard loudly enough. We're challenged at SIR with always a, a greater desire to do more things than we have the budget for. Um, but what I've found all along is if you continue to sort of help people sort of see the story and help people transform where they want to go, then um, a lot of things really will, will find, their, find their way. So I, you know, I, I think that um, I'd be happy to answer more questions. I don't really want to use too much of the panel time because I think probably the stories of the others in terms of how they got to where they are um, could be really powerful for the group to hear. And I'll turn it over to um, Jim. Maybe. All right. Well, thank you so much, Sue, and and um, thanks to all of you who are listening and to the other panelists here and. I should just start out by saying that um, it, it's really a great, it's actually a privilege to be able to do this. And I hope that we're able to inspire people who want to get involved. Uh, I think one thing everyone should know is that there's never enough good volunteers. And we'll put a little emphasis on good. Um, I will tell you this, as a person who has been in private practice his whole career, um, I found, I, I've always had an interest in, in somewhat of an interest in academic medicine, but but being in private practice, I found that I was able to fulfill my career goals and dreams by working outside of my group through the society. And that volunteer and the things that I was able to achieve are really what provided me my professional satisfaction. And then it flipped around because many of the good things that came from the volunteerism then came back and provided benefit to our group. So just in a minute or two, because we want everyone to talk, I, I'm going to mention uh, just a couple key points as I thought this through of things that really, um, if you were trying to get involved or you want to get involved and you're not sure how, just a couple tips, okay? So I mentioned that this is highly rewarding. So you, you'll find that the more, like everything in life, the harder you work at something, the harder it is to give up. The more involved you get, the more involved you want to be. Um, when I started out, I got turned down a dozen times asking, but you have to go out there. You have to make it known that you want to do this. You have to be a little bit forward. You have to sometimes contact people in the society who you may not know, and you have to make sure your name comes up. And if you get turned down once, twice, three or five times, that doesn't mean anything. Stay with it because if you have something to give, it's just that people may not recognize you when you're young. You will get there. So don't give up if you don't get something right away. Ideally, you can meet a mentor, an older person in your group, or someone you know from training who is involved, and they can help promote your name. So I, to this day, and, and I'm one of the more senior guys, if there's something I want to get involved in in the society, I'll call someone on the PAD service line, on the Venus service line, and say, hey, get me involved. I don't wait to be asked because people may not know you want to be asked. So if you have a mentor or an elder person who can help you, do that. Most importantly, when you start out as a volunteer, it's if you're doing volunteer work to get to get something on your CV or just to say you're doing it to get to the annual meeting, it's kind of a waste of time. In order to really be a good volunteer, you have to deliver. You have to deliver a product. So when you get on these committees, you have to deliver. You have to do your work. The One of the big problems we have is that we get lots and lots of volunteers, but 90% of the work is done by 20% of the people. 
be in that 20%, take a project on and deliver the goods, stay with it, do the work. You have to be very open-minded because you're going to work with people in different practice models who have different life views than you do, different political views, different medical views. So you have to be you have to be able to put on your SIR hat and say, I'm working for the society and the betterment of a larger group of people, not for myself. It's not hard to do, but it does take a little adjustment. And the final thing I'd tell you is do a deep dive on it. Get into it. Don't volunteer and do things you don't like. If someone says, hey, we need someone on a committee that you're not interested in, don't waste your time if you're not interested. Find what you like, and when you get there, do the deep dive and deliver the goods. So those would be my, my key points, and I think I'll take a little pause here and pass it on um, maybe to Maureen, if you're there. I am. Thank you. I'm, I'm sort of in awe of this panel and feel that I should be in the audience because this is quite the heavy hitting group here. Um, so thank you for uh, allowing me to participate. Um, you know, I think that um, my experience has been um, nothing but rewarding when it comes to academic interventional radiology and also involvement in the society and all of its um, different branches. I've met some incredible people, including the people on this panel who I call dear friends, and um, I'm sure some of the people that are um, listening. So I think it's a very much uh, enriching um, uh, opportunity. I think that, uh, you know, like everybody else, I, you know, wanted to go to medical school and be a doctor, and then I found my way into interventional radiology um, with a very, very different plan in mind. I thought I was going to work in private practice and do breast imaging and interventional radiology on the side. And uh, that plan changed dramatically when I did my IR fellowship at UCSF and um, didn't really think I would want to do anything other than IR. Um, but, I, uh, but I found um, through my women's imaging uh, fellowship that I really did gravitate towards women's health and interventions and felt that I could be a voice um, for the different procedures that need to be emphasized more like uterine fibroid embolization or treatment of conditions where unfortunately women just don't get thought of that much um, when it comes to, you know, preserving fertility, avoiding hysterectomy and, and so on and so forth. So it's been a, it, so I, I didn't, I want to say I had a grandmaster plan to become chief and I didn't. I uh, always loved education, which is why Parag and I have always connected. Um, I was the associate program director and I loved interacting with our trainees, medical students, residents, fellows, and just sort of thought that I would just continue that until, um, you know, uh, an opportunity arose at my home institution and I, um, and I threw my, my hat into the, into the ring or into the fire, whichever one you want to believe. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that it was probably one of the hardest things I've had to do. I've tried to explain as to why I would want to lead a section, um, with so much history. And it's been an incredible journey, uh, two years in the making. Um, and, uh, you know, we've grown as a section and hired new people and, you know, are sort of changing our identity as we, as we pay forward. In terms of challenges, um, I'm just gonna say it right off the bat because I am a woman who happens to be an interventional radiologist and that brings with it a number of, uh, different challenges, unique challenges. Um, and we're happy, I'm happy to discuss those later, but, um, there's certainly, um, you know, specifically, uh, being a woman interventional radiologist at an institution where you grew up, um, at, you know, where you're sort of the kid and now you're the boss and having to navigate that, those relationships can be a little bit, um, you know, at first challenging, but ultimately fine. Um, I think that. Uh, time management is a really great skill, you know, trying to be involved as much as you can and not have others have the perception that, you know, you can't handle something or you don't want to do something. But as Jim said, you know, only volunteer when you really want to do something and can deliver. So we all make sacrifices. We all have families. But, you know, this important 
Um, and I think one of the last things um, before I stop is, you know, how do you keep going? You know, how do you keep doing more? You know, Parag's done all this stuff. Jim Sue's done all this stuff, and yet they're still continuing. And I think it's because of, of the people on this panel and the people who are listening. I think it's the energy and the buzz and everything that Sue and Jim said. You know, it's a family. And you look forward to going to the annual meeting, not just because you get to be on the podium and give a talk or present your abstract or do a fun workshop, but because you're going to go hang out with your friends who you only see just a few times a year. And and the more you see this society and this field as, as an extension of your family, you know, the kind that you get to choose to hang out with, um, then the, the, the more, um, you know, fulfilling it, it, it becomes. And it's sort of this gift that keeps on going and giving. And I really have appreciated every minute of it. I certainly wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Jim's mentorship and Sue's, you know, uh, kind words and, and Parag's um, something, um, uh, probably his great wisdom. So that's all I'm going to say. On to All right, you, Parag. So finish. On to me. Right, can everyone hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yes. Yes. Yeah, perfect. So I want to thank um, thank the RFS for for holding this this panel, and and also want to uh, thank the friends and colleagues that I have on on the panel with me, all of which um, I've had the good fortune of working with closely uh, for a number of different uh, uh, goals or or reasons throughout my career. So I'm I'm really thankful for that. And all of us, including those who are on this webinar listening, has found their calling um, within the society or within our specialty and came to it in different ways. And for me, uh, not unlike Maureen, I think there was uh, perhaps a different path, I thought, in medical school or in residency, uh, and certainly not um, the one that I've currently taken or, or shown in the last um, you know, 10 to 15 years. Um, uh, but I'm really thankful for it. And... And I guess what I what I want to say with regards to my entry into leadership was it started with very small things and very small beginnings. Um, you know, I didn't enter into um, my fellowship with aspirations to be uh, the future president or or it, within leadership that was grander than being a really strong clinical interventional radiologist that contributed to my local community. And that might have been in private practice in other ways, but I was fortunate to join a great, really progressive group. Um, and knew that immediately uh, and any aspirations to be a leader within this group wasn't going to be by trying to uh, grab a title or become the next uh, chief because quite honestly there was phenomenal leadership already there. But the areas in which I thought I could find my passion and interest in were uh, for me locally uh, within education and within my clinical interests within vascular disease and aortic work and I created a niche um, and said I'm going to try to make a difference or make my work while uh, work product matter uh, as it does in my local community and that was here in Milwaukee and um, and small opportunities led to greater opportunities and uh, I will tell you that I was able to uh, have the good fortune to to really mold and develop a training program that had already had all the pieces of something that I thought could be really phenomenal into um, what we have now which is something we're really proud of but then develop a, as a as opportunities from people on this panel uh, provided me to be uh, a lecturer in a small workshop or contribute in a small meeting setting and then take the initiative to say how could we make this better and and not to push through changes but to suggest and to try to innovate in a way that I thought might be more meaningful not for me personally but for the audience or for uh, the people that we were trying to serve and educate and that was thankfully received well, um, and not everything was taken uh, as I suggested it, uh, to Jim's point and to others. Uh, not everything you suggest or, or do will succeed, but you persist because it matters to you, and you continue to do that by leading by example. And I knew that if I did that locally, um, I'd be fulfilled at the very least, and that's really ultimately um, you know, what mattered, that I thought I was doing something for my local trainee. But lo and behold, there was an opportunity to run a training course for the SIR um, for our fellows, and that turned into uh, a really strong passion project, the Fellow Spring Practicum, and that grew um, in the time that I was involved with it. And right around the, you know, some of my early time in that, I had opportunities to um, suggest uh, improvements within our new training programs. And as we all know, there's been fundamental change in that. And 
some of this was timing and having shown that I was invested in this space to begin with and those small opportunities done well um, presented other opportunities and I needed to make sure that whichever ones I chose I did them well and this this hits on some of the points that were mentioned earlier um, take the opportunities you have and do them extremely well but don't try and hoard titles or positions because I don't think that shows leadership but I think taking the ones that you do have and doing them extremely well hopefully ones that resonate with your own personal passion or interests um, will allow people to see the potential leadership that you have and quite frankly that's allowed me to do many of the things that I've, I've had and this is a phenomenal specialty that allows for wonderful partnerships and abilities to reach out to colleagues not just in your local institution but people we've met um, across the country and, and get feedback and, and insight into how to solve things and I've been um, the product of a lot of that good fortune myself when I reached out and I'm and really thankful to be in the position to be able to do that uh, for others now. Um, and so that's sort of in a, in a nutshell or brief, um, you know, nugget how I think I got into the leadership opportunities here and how I think others can perhaps do the same um, when given the opportunity. Thank you all for, for sharing your first thoughts. Um, you are all truly inspiring. Um, from hearing all of you, I think I gather a few key points. Uh, engage yourself, do it with passion, persevere despite adversity, and encourage others. You know, keep encouraging your team. Um, I have a few questions. Um, if the um, audience have questions, please, you know, type in the question box or raise your hand. I uh, will give you the mic. Um, but I have a few questions that I um, prepare for you guys. I'm um, eager to um, hear what you think. So the first question I have is, how do you deal with um, difficult personalities in your team and successfully keep the team moving forward? Well, I could I could take a quick stab at that, um, if that's okay. That's that's yeah. a that's a great question because it's something that we all have to deal with, and and um, I, I think. It, the main thing when you when you're trying to accomplish something is to stay focused on the mission. So the one thing not to do when there's difficult personalities is to engage in interpersonal differences. So um, if, if if somebody is very hard and very demanding, tr irritating, going head to head with that person generally doesn't get anywhere. So it's often a discussion outside of a group committee. What, one thing I found very, very helpful when we organize committees and, and work with people is we sometimes, I do this in our hospital a lot and have done it in the SIR at times, when somebody has an opposing view and they're contrarian, though we actually, I like having those people engaged in the committee. Um, rather than excluding them. Because I think you want to keep your enemies as close as your friends, so to speak. Um, because if you eventually win those people over, the people who are the strongest hard-headed against something you want can often be your biggest advocate when you flip them. So I think it's very important to try to engage and include people who have differences in opinions. Um, but it does take a little bit of work outside of the committee level itself or the organization level itself to have these kind of one-on-ones and engagement and you have to make that person feel like they are contributing that they're not always a contrarian and if you can do that often you flip that person and they become your biggest advocate jim i would add to what you said which i think is so key it really is about that clarity around what you're trying to accomplish you know i think folks are really there for the same reasons, then then you can find lots of opportunity for a difference of opinion that'll ultimately take you forward. Um, but but sometimes stopping to make sure that you're asking yourself what it is you're trying to do, asking the other person what it is that they're trying to do, and see where these these challenging parts are, are sort of rising up and, and coming in the way. You know, I always like to think of the idea that confrontation really is more the Latin with than against, right? So that that con side of it, and the, and the more that you can come to some common understanding with folks that you're finding difficult, you at least are making sure that you're staying true to what you're trying to do as a leader and hearing them out and bringing them along. 
And then you also have to know when it's time to just say, huh. not going to work. <laughs> yep. All right. Um, I have another question here. I think um, also Alex have, uh, has a few other questions, but um, I wanted to ask a question um, to everyone, actually. I would like to, to hear everyone's opinion about this. Um, how do you deal with and possibly positively change unconscious bias to increase diversity? Monica, I didn't hear that very well. Do you mind repeating? Sure. How do you deal with and positively change unconscious biases to increase diversity? I know it's a very hard question. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll, well, I can I'll take, take a stab, stab at, at this. Oh, you oh. Go for it, Chloe. Go for I it, Chloe. Bert. You got this. No, I said for <laughs> Um you know, it's hard. Um, I think the, I mean, we all know this, but changing culture is hard um, and changing the way people think is hard. And, um, you know, we all want to have those rosy glasses and think that, you know, the new generation are going to not be like the old generation. But the problem is the new generation is, are still taught um, and they are still emulating the old generation. So I think that as most things, um, education is, um, is front and center. I think that um, I love that uh, nowadays when I go to a meeting, there's always, almost always, a woman and I are something, whether it's a panel discussion, whether it's a cocktail reception, whether it's an outing, but it's a way of just sort of establishing that, yes, we're a minority and we are here and we want to talk about, you know, some of the challenges, but we want to do it in a positive way. So I think like educating people and then involving people. So I think it was one thing if a bunch of women get together and talk about the different challenges that they go through during IR, but I think the best way is to involve um, the whole IR community, right? The young men who are in IR, the old men who are in IR, the old women who are in IR, the young women. So the entire community, the entire range. And so people can learn new things and, and, and be able to understand like, oh, I now understand why such and such, you know, statement made so-and-so feel uncomfortable. I didn't realize it. And I mean, it's as simple as that. I mean, I'm being a little idealistic because there will always be individuals who have a very strong unconscious bias. And, you know, I don't, don't admit that, but I think that through education, through these activities, getting people together um, and talking about these issues, um, at least you can start to make some change. And then I think the the other thing is uh, through leadership opportunities and proper training, right? You cannot be what you cannot see. So we need more and more women and underrepresented minorities in our field in leadership positions so that it can recruit um, people who uh, would, would be able to identify with those figures. Um, and lastly, I think having people like Monica, you know, talk about her experiences. Um, you don't have to be Jim Beninati to, to get on a panel and talk about your experience, right? Because there is a high school student or a college student who is gonna look up to, to, to you and, and you will affect their life. And I think that at, at every point in your life, you could be a mentor and a sponsor. So I. I think about this in a multi-pronged approach, and I think at each level through education, through open dialogue and community building and leadership training and, and positioning, um, we can have a, a better strategy to overcome these uh, challenges. Those are great points, Maureen, and I think um, you highlight a number of what I think are impor important issues within society, not just society of intervention reality, but I think every um, every work sector with regards to this issue, unconscious bias. And I think the first step is just recognizing that it exists and that no one is immune to it. Um, even the most uh, diverse individuals uh, have their own uh, set of unconscious bias. And so the, I think that's the first thing because I think we tend to run towards our biases. We tend to see the world uh, the way we want to see it. Um, and once you recognize that, that that may not 
be right or frequently can at times be at odds with uh, another individual or another uh, group of individuals, then we begin to allow ourselves to sort of learn um, or, or, or make change uh, for the better. Uh, and so uh, to that end, once you recognize that, then you you can then try to do that by example. And so um, is that educating yourself, first of all? Um, unconscious bias is a broad term, and there are a, a number of different types of biases that encompass that. Um, and recognizing those first, and then identifying when we do do that. Um, you, many of us are probably an example to uh, education locally with regards to this. This has been a hot button uh, topic uh, overall within um, within medicine, I think, and within academia, uh, but it's not unique to, to our specialty. Um, I think I think it's important that the society talks about this. I do think representation is important, and I do think how you approach that from an educational point of view or within a committee work structure or the construct of a panel or a, uh, a work group is important. Uh, and it's a diversity of thought that allows us to think outside our little uh, siloed or echo chambers that we, we, we tend to uh, hear what we want to hear. But the moment we bring uh, a diversity of thought uh, in, then we might see the contrarian point of view. And, and oftentimes they may enlighten us to things that we just have no uh, ability to see. And so I think that's important. Um, <clears throat> you know, we may not be able to change everything uh, that we want to, but until we recognize it, it definitely won't be changed at all. And it, it and I think, I think you hit on a number of the important points. I think the societies work hard, or, and, but can do more. Uh, and and I think it's something that they're aware of. And I and I mm -hmm. think seeing leadership that represents the diverse group that uh, we want our specialty to represent is is important to to provide. Thank you. Um, thank you. That was great. Those are great um, answers. Um, does anybody have a, a, another opinion, uh, Dr. Beninati or Sue, before we move to the next question? Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to chime in a little bit. You know, I, I we are really trying to work very much at, at SIR to um, both foster a more diverse engagement um, for everybody within the organization, and at the same time, really focus on what does it take to actually create a more inclusive workforce. And those really do go hand in hand. And, and so I think that we recognize the challenges in that. And, and when I think about the things that we worry about or we contemplate when it comes to diverse workforce, it truly is a diversity of thought. You know, we have just as concerned and passionate about trying to make sure that the variety of IR practices that you may find yourself in will resonate with your passion for IR your passion for wanting to um, take a private practice approach or an academic approach or practice, passion for wanting to focus on oncology or women's health or PAD, um, as well as your own personal passion in terms of what you bring to work every day. Um, and and that, that's, that takes a long time to both continuously grow the profession in a diverse perspective and to then identify and help practices come along as we really increase that inclusiveness. So the uh, diversity and inclusiveness task force uh, that we have um, for the organization, I think Maureen is involved in that as well, is really trying to tackle this at a variety of issues at a variety of levels. You know, we're trying to first benchmark and identify really what our numbers are, what, where, we, where we stand in terms of diversity within the profession as well as the society and set some goals and some targets for ourselves and measure that so we can know that we're making some progress. We also really want to then focus on education for the membership and, and, and find a place and an opportunity to have some of these conversations. Um, we want to ensure that our programs and services really do reflect our attitudes and our, our stance on diversity and so we pay a lot of attention to ensuring that the image that SIR presents on behalf of the specialty still resonates with those values. And the last piece of that is to really we still are looking to the idea that ultimately our goal is to create a diverse workforce so that it mirrors the population and that we're better equipped to deal with and, and help the people of color, the 
people of variety of, of gender and sexual orientation and identity as they face some of the challenges they face. We know there are health disparities between men and women. We know there are health disparities based on race. And I think the more that we can look at that are as an opportunity to help advance and to close the gaps in some of those areas, then we're not just embracing diversity and inclusiveness for the benefit of the profession, but we're really doing it at that broader, larger level. And again, that speaks to that concept of leadership that we really want to inspire folks to is, yes, it's personal, it's about you, but what are the, what are the other ripples that, that can be created because of the work that we do? So I would just uh, say, Sue, congratulations to the SIR leadership, um, um, you in particular, because there's been very noticeable changes in our society over the past five to seven years that um, has really, really has highlighted the um, the efforts that society's made, and I think it's become very apparent now that that in our society we have a wide variety of diverse people. Um, we're seeing women in leadership roles and in at levels and in numbers that we hadn't seen before. And uh, I think it really speaks to the efforts of you and your staff and the rest of the uh, SIR leaders that have made this happen. So congratulations. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. And um, this is Alex Kutsenka. And um, I want to thank, uh, thank you to Monica for organizing this amazing leadership webinar series. Um, over the last year, I was learning so much, um, all the advice on leadership, so much inspiration. And thank you, um, uh, thank you the whole panel uh, for being uh, today in the evening with us and spending your time uh, to teach us more. Um, so I have a couple of questions. And um, as um, early um, trainee and kind of uh, entering IR specialty, a lot of us have a lot of passion for the specialty, but we still are not very efficient in managing our time. So I was wondering if all of you could give us some advice on time management and um, how you manage to um, achieve so many things and do incredible amount of work and do it well, and at the same time still probably have some personal life and have some um, time for yourself. Could you please help us with this? <laughs> oh boy. Um, well, you know, I, I'd be happy to to jump in. Uh, you know, I I am um, a little bit obviously different from from the the work burden that you all face. But um, the unique thing about working at an association as as I do and as the staff at SIR does is that our work day um, is often uh, your work day only in reverse right so so we know that a volunteer is going to want to put in their time when they're done with their day job um, and, and so it can be a challenge for staff and, and in particular i find myself helping to coach staff through how do you balance this desire to want to always be on and always really help with this really really important need to make sure you take that time out for yourself um, and in particular, unlike uh, the profession, we have a lot of women working at headquarters SIR, and a lot of them have families, and a lot of them are really trying to help juggle that that activity. Um, you know, the the best the best advice I often give people, I'm very analytically minded. Um, you find a balance in your life by focusing on the denominator in this 100% equation, not the numerator. You can keep piling as many things or taking things off on the top of that plate to try to satisfy what you want to do. But until you have that opportunity to sort of stop and say, this is all I can do, and be very responsible, very thoughtful about what that is, then you're never going to find that balance. And so it really takes a lot of mindfulness and a lot of thinking to, to really make sure you have your priorities set and you can really make sure that you are achieving success at the level that is what you desire. Um, and that will be ebb and flow. You can't beat yourself up. That way it may change from one day to the next. It may change from one point in your career to another. Um, but always keep that, that sense that you have to be the one who can identify what 100% what means to you. 
so I think I think those are great points, and I think um, it gets back to something we said earlier. You you have to when you commit to do something, make sure it's something you want to do and you like to do, because then when you do it, you have passion about it, and it, it isn't a burden. And um, my only bit of advice to all of you is that we're all in different phases in life, so there are different times in your life when going all in on three things is doable, whereas there's other parts when maybe going all in on any one thing is difficult. And if it were up to me, and I could tell you, I've, I've been involved in a lot of things, but at different points in my life, when my kids were at different stages in life, I dialed things up and dialed things down. And um, I, I, I think people who know me always understand that the single most important thing despite all the great things at work and all the education you put in, is you have to take care of your own mental well-being and your own family. And if you put that as your top priority, the work stuff will fall into place afterwards. Yeah. I, I would like to jump back in again, too, because I think, um, you know, when I first started at SIR, Jim was the president. And I, I speak with the president every week. We always chat about the various things we're trying to work on and the problems we're trying to work on. But without a doubt, every time Jim and I spoke, he said to me, how are we doing? How, how's the time that we're putting on you working out? How, how's the balance coming? How are you, how are you, you know, how are you, how are you managing from a time perspective? And, you know, that's really critical to, to know that in leadership position, someone's asking about, that balance the, about how it's working for you is really important. So thank you, Jim. You're welcome, Sue. You know, answering this question presumes that uh, I figured this out, which I, I haven't, I don't think. Um, uh, I think Jim and Sue have uh, uh, probably a longer track record uh, at success perhaps at this, at least it's been proven. But I, I have worked at this quite a bit in regards to time management strategies. I think we all do, uh, regardless of our, our, our leadership title or position. Um, you know, we're always constantly juggle, juggling clinical work and, and or practice development and administrative or academic pursuits, not to mention the volunteer efforts <clears throat> for the society or other, other uh, uh, organizations that we belong to and then we haven't even begun the family life so my strategies have always been to prioritize the areas of uh, of work that have value to me or that resonate with me because when I'm really tired and I really have to get a project done or completed um, it's a lot easier if I'm really passionate or have uh, a significant value um, uh, put to that particular project that it means something to me um, because uh, you really have to produce when you choose to take something on. Uh, I've learned to be better and more efficient at getting certain things done, but that has its limits. Because as you take on more uh, work, uh, you can only be so efficient. Because eventually, it's just time has uh, has its limitations. And so I try to compartmentalize as my family has grown. And I have two young girls. Um, it's important for me, very important to me personally to, to be with them. And so I, when I leave work, I really do try to leave that side of my work and, uh, and try to be very singularly focused with, uh, with, with my family when that time comes um, uh, at that part of the day or weekend. Um, and and I, I get back to giving back to myself a little bit, taking care of yourself. My day starts usually with my own time and I, and I, you do that with what you do if you're into yoga or you're into meditation or exercise uh, or certain hobbies that bring you um, an outlet to your day-to-day -day work, you know, even if that's for 30 minutes. <clears throat> There's a lot of mental benefit to that, and, and I take that strategy to heart uh, and do that on a regular basis. Um, and, and that lets me uh, give back to myself uh, before I sort of do all the things I do for uh, our patients, our colleagues, our partners, um, and the different projects that I'm, I'm engaged with. Those are the strategies that I've taken on. It's really hard for me to add anything at this point. I think everybody on the panel has said everything. Um, you know, Jim was one of the first people who instilled this family first uh, mentality um, into me. Um, I think, uh, again, something that Jim Beninati said earlier today is 
only sign up for things that excite you, sign up for things that you can give, um, you know, your all to, um, so that when you sign up the next time, there's no doubt on anybody's mind that you're going to, you know, bring your highest level of commitment and dedication. Um, I think that it helps to have a, you know, a partner who's very understanding. They don't have to be a physician, but they, um, ha and, and I think it's okay to have your children know that you're, you know, you want to do these things. And I hope that my son, you know, can, can learn some of, some of these things that my husband and I have taught him. So I think what I do is I try to be very open, you know, like I can't right now be with my family because I'm on this conference call and that's okay, you know. Um, because I'm not on a conference call every night. So I think when you're on, whether it's at work or for any sort of extra work um, event, uh, whether it's the society or anything locally or regionally, um, you, you carve out some of your family time or some of your private time. But then the most important thing, is, as everybody said, including Prague, is to, is to give back, right? So when it's the weekend or if it's, um, you know, the holidays, um, you know, certainly I, I can, if I get an email and it's a work email and it's not urgent, um, I respond and I say, it's like on a Saturday, I say, like, I got this email. I'm going to look at it first thing in the morning, Sunday, because, you know, if it's not urgent on a Saturday, I'd like to be with my family. So there's ways of, of letting the person who's on the other end know that you received the message. You know, you're not ignoring them. You're not too busy. You're not, you know, stressed out, you know, like, all these issues that people may think if you don't get an immediate, re if they don't get an immediate response, but it's just the conscious effort of, you know, it carving out the time and prioritizing. So Saturday, you know, if I'm home, I'd like to do things around the house, nothing fabulous, but, but I'm still engaged with my work and with, with, with my activities. And if, of course, something happens with an emergency at work, of course, I'm going to attend to it. But trying to compartmentalize is really important. And and I find, as, as everybody says, it changes, right? Sometimes I feel like the most amazing mom and a terrible wife and like a horrible doctor. And then sometimes I feel like an amazing doctor and a terrible this and terrible that. So I always feel it's like a game of juggling. Um, and that's okay, you know, because I think like you're always conscious of it and you're always trying to do better, but it's okay to pull back from one thing and give to the other. So long as you know when to go back and, you know, and make it right um, when the time is, is, is available to you. Thank you for those answers. Um, this is definitely a work in progress, I think. And um, I'm, as a fellow, I find myself juggling all the time with all the responsibilities in, in personal life as well. I, I, the only thing I could add is, I, I think you've mentioned it already, but um uh, giving time to family or your significant other, I think, uh, give quality time, um, be present, you know, instead of working on something while talking to them or having dinner with them while you're on the computer or answering your phone or sending texts or, you know, um, be present, be there, try to have some quality time. And if there's no other way around it, you still have to work and try to achieve some time, at least communicate that, you know, let them know, Hey, you know, I, I, I have all these things to do, but I would really like to do those with you or around you or, you know, with company. Um, I am sorry that we don't have time, but this is what I can do. You know, I know it's harder, mm -hmm. harder with, with kids. I don't have kids personally, but that's probably harder to do. But at least with adults, you can communicate that. And at least I think it, it conveys the message of I'm making an effort. Um, yeah, so those... Those were just my two cents about that. That's great. Um, but another another question here, um, kind of maybe ties up to that. But um, what what could be best strategies um uh, to guide a mentee? I know we all are mentors in certain <laughs> ways, certain stages. You know, the more um senior physicians or senior um um people in the society um probably have a different way to approach mentorship and then um, I think we're all mentors in, in a way I think like for me for example to medical students to all their residents um, but what are good strategies to guide them and keep them engaged and um, try to to continue or provide some growth to their love and passion for the specialty
Well, I can I can touch on that a little bit. <clears throat> I think mentorship, um, uh, as was mentioned earlier, is a two way street. Uh, I think someone had said that earlier, but I think it's important not for the mentor, but also the mentee understand that there is a give and take on both sides, and the mentee isn't uh, isn't really just there to accept a uh, knowledge or mentorship alone, but is in in theory trying to give back in some way. Maybe there's a a regular communication schedule or a uh, uh, specific uh, area of growth that the mentee wants to work on and perhaps the mentor is helping to guide them or maybe it's on an area of their particular uh, strength and sometimes what a mentor does is, is guide you to to other resources or, or letting the mentee know that you can have more than one mentor. I've often said to some of our junior faculty that it's great to have a mentor within our division, a senior person so to speak, that seems like the natural uh, path that people take, but but looking to others, perhaps outside our specialty or even across organizations outside of our organizations, can give you a perspective that isn't biased within the walls of your institution, because those within your own practice or program or your health system uh, may view it singularly and have their own let's unconscious bias, for lack of a better term, um, than those from the outside and it can be very helpful to to have um, uh, different perspectives shared. So I think listening and meeting with some regularity, but also understanding that they're, depending on how the relationship is set up, um, that it, it's actually a give and take on both sides. And the mentor will give quite a bit, but I think oftentimes the mentee um, gives much in, in return to the mentor as far as um, seeing their growth. And, and that's very, very valuable to many of us. Sure. Yeah, that Prague, I think you really nailed it there. I mean, it is a give and take. And 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 I know we certainly see within the various mentor programs at SIR, but even you know, you walk the halls of the annual meeting and and I'm always amazed the young person will come up to a seasoned, well respected individual and ask a question and engage. And and I get the vantage point of being able to see them both walk away with a smile on their face because that engagement, that that giving back, even the questions and the and the probing and and, and um, engaging at that level is really a powerful, powerful motivator. And and you know I think particularly within the profession, the more we can enrich those around us with the questions we ask or the the ways we express ourselves, then, then we really are advancing the entirety of the organization. And it speaks to that sort of bring bring your passion for what's connected to you, make it personal, but but know that you're giving for so much more. Yeah, and I, I would just echo the fact that um, the mentor can get every bit as much out of a relationship as the mentee. It's not just rewarding, but look, you know, older people or more senior people tend to get fixed in their ways. And what keeps your mind open is exposure to new ideas, exposure to the question why or what if. And who asks that? Younger people who are who are trying to move into different positions. So I find my interactions with our trainees, our residents, with younger people I'm trying to mentor, I, I actually I think many times in, in talking to my friends on this call, Parag and Maureen, for example, who are younger than me, if they ask me for advice, I hang the phone up or walk away from a conversation feeling like I've learned more than they have. It's, it's really beneficial for me. So I think it's, it's a bilateral kind of give and take that's rewarding on both ends. Thank you. Um, Dr. Poye, you want to add anything? Or? Well, I think, um, I mean, again, nothing that I can add, uh, new information. I think like it's the fundamental uh, premise of our practice, right? The apprenticeship, the mentee-mentor relationship. I do want to say that um, 
there is a as, since we're talking about mentorship and men, and being a mentee or a mentor, um, it is a distinction about sponsorship. So I had the the luxury of meeting Alex just a few months ago, and you know I can't wait to to connect with her again. And and just you meet someone, and you may not be the one that's advising them in their every single move, but you can open some doors for them, right? So you can ask them to you know, give a talk somewhere or join a committee or, you know, work on with you with a project. So I think that that's also um, a, another very important part of the relationship that happens between the senior and junior individuals in IR. And, and the relationships can be very different. And, and the outcome, though, is, is still the same. It's just trying to bring up this new generation of brilliant individuals who are going to be the future of our specialty. Thank you so much for good, um, good words as well. Um, so to kind of tie up two of these questions between managing the time and at the same time trying to um, give the time to mentors and mentees, um, how do you feel about the social media? Because sometimes it takes quite a bit of time and might be a distractor from other things which could be done but at the same time there is a lot of connections which are happening on like twitter or some other like linkedin or other social media channels and there is a lot of information and cases shared and uh, how, how do you feel about social media and how much it should be used uh I've got, I'm happy to take a little stab at that. I mean, my, my take on, on you know, your personal network, I guess, is one way to think about it, is that you know, you, you, every individual needs to, first of all, make sure it works for them, right? So you want to make sure that you have the people in, in, the, in, in your network that, that can help you advance where you want to go, make you feel good about what you're trying to accomplish bring you up, make you stronger. I mean, it's, it's your, it's your go-to people. Um, but the concept of making sure you have both strong and weak ties in your network is really key. You know, the weak, the weak ties don't have to be somebody that they're, you know, that they're going to really be best friends with or, or do more. Um, but they really are just some people that you meet and they share a little bit, tidbit of information and it, connects with you with something else and it connects with another person connects with the person and I think the social has really changed fundamentally changed the world's ability to have these weak network ties and make them really powerful and impactful and so I, I personally think there's great value in finding that right balance um, you, know, you still need to make sure you've got these strong ties that people that really know you and that they challenge you and can support you and sponsor you um, but can't really ignore the idea that the world is, is also about these kind of broader reaching weak connections that are really good to have. So with regards to social media, my thoughts on, on this is it's a powerful tool. It can clearly uh, see the value in, in connecting people, getting the word out or letting people know what you're involved in or your views are certainly wonderful for marketing and it has the double-edged sword of uh, perhaps uh, proliferating uh, knowledge and content but also misinformation too and you know we've seen uh, examples of really great educators utilizing the tool to, to advocate for um, clinical disease states or or, or patients uh, and and at times seen examples where uh, you know so-called, uh, I don't know, social media experts within the disease state uh, are for no other reason because they, they tweet a lot of cases may not always show something that is mainstream or 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 standard of care, let's say. And so you wonder or cringe, like, who, who is the impressionable person on the other side of that, um, that post and, and what are they taking from that? Um, do they have the context for which to understand what, what other, where, where that fits in or not? Um, as far as my use of it, um, it is um, sparing, I guess, uh, relative to colleagues of mine who are very prolific in this space. But it really goes to my time management um, and picking and choosing the things that I've 
uh, put time into it. It has not allowed me the flexibility to sort of spend time um, setting regular posts. And maybe that's an excuse. I do see the value in it, and at times I'll be more uh, more involved than others. But um, uh, I do do think that we need to be thoughtful about how we use it and understanding that just being on it um, and just showing cases um, or just um, uh, stating our, our opinions can can help other people understand where we stand or where 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 we fit in within a particular viewpoint, but but also has um, you know has some potential uh, downsides too. So uh, I'm always sort of mindful of that when I'm mentoring trainees as to their use in it, and it seems to me that um, uh, that there's still value for for getting the word out or connecting people, and and certainly I think there's a, a, a significant utility amongst my trainees. So. Uh, I realize that that's probably a, a new mode of uh, sort of getting the word out as opposed to say email <laughs> or 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 e newsletters, let's say. So there there is value, and so we need to be able to harness that. Yeah, Prague, I agree that there's, and I agree with Sue, that there's value in that, and I I also agree that there's a lot there's a lot of things I'm either neutral or down on, and I think one thing I'm not a huge fan on. Is posting cases because I get concerned about violations of privacy. And I also think that in a lot of the social media things that I see, the same people continually answer. They're like, I don't think they're expert, but I think they look at themselves as a forum to kind of become an expert. And I wonder how impressionable the person reading the pile of BS that I'm looking at really might be. So I, I would say when it comes to the cases and advice on how to do things, I'm, I'm very skeptical about that. As far as getting information out and communicating and a way to network, I think it's invaluable. Um, so I'm kind of, I have, you know, I think it's much more valuable than not, but I definitely see some problems. Um, but I will say this, if you want to get into time management, someone else said it earlier, Shut your phone off once in a while. If you're spending too, you can spend a lot of time on that and kill a lot of time during the day. So I think one thing you can do is use that wisely, but don't live on it because it does suck up a lot of time. I agree with everything that the panel said. I think my biggest concern um, echoes that of Jim Beninati that, um, uh, and there have been cases where, um, you know, uh, it's a little bit um, the identity of the individual patient may have maybe easily you know figured out given the complexity of the case and the you know the date and time that's um, posted. Um, I think that it's a it's a nice community. I certainly am as as Prague said. I'm probably one of the very like light posters um, on social media and. Um, I generally have a purpose behind it, whether it's, you know, for women, um, you know, in, in, in IR, or whether it's for UCSF or, you know, deep respected <clears throat> colleagues. Um, I, I don't tend to post just random cases just because um, there's more complexity than to just, you know, post a random case. I think like there's a lot more thought that has gone into, you know, the case and you're sort of in a way robbing it. Of, of all of that by just like putting out, uh, you know, the last image, even though it's so tempting to do that. But because um, um, it's, you know, sometimes it's not necessarily the end result that's that's the most important, but it's the process of getting there and how the patient um, and their family feels. So I've been a little, uh, you know, um, cautious about doing that. But at the same time, I just want to say it for to the panel, like we're dating ourselves because this is the generation of yep. social media. And, yep. you know, I just found out yep. about this new platform that my son is using and he's 10, you know, and it freaks me out. But, um, but I think that we need to connect um, and be on social media as a specialty and as individuals. Um, <clears throat> what, what, to what manner we should reference cases and patients um, should be done in the most appropriate way to protect to their privacy um, and not make it be like we're these big bad cowboys doing these big bad cases, um, but rather that you know we're trying to teach patients who are also on social media or other referrings that we too can treat fibroids or can 
open up, you know, these arteries that have been closed for a long time and, and, and prevent amputation. So I do see the good there. And I think that it's a culture, you know, paradigm shift, but we, it needs to be, um, you know, like most things, uh, you know, thought out, well thought out and, uh, and, and a little cautious um, with, with performing the little like act of sending the tweet. I think I totally mm -hmm. dated myself and I sound like an ancient person, but <laughs> well, I'll date myself, Maureen. <laughs> if I haven't oh, talked you. to you, if I haven't talked to you in five years, I don't really want to. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. That was great advice about the social media. And um, it's become very big right now. And I'm also wondering for us uh, if you as big leaders and actually knowing scientifically what should be shown, not going to be present on the social media, then someone else will be on the social media, but they might not show the same quality of information. So it's kind of both ways, I guess it should be probably used by someone like you who knows uh, the correct way to present cases and show the knowledge and skills. Um, to kind of, we, we're a little bit running out of time. Um, do you have any final remarks or any comments or any leadership advice for all of us in the session? I might just start out and say, first of all, thank you to to everyone who put this together. And I think this, this is a testament to what good young leaders can do because these webinars are run by people who are residents and in trainee and trainees. And I think your efforts are absolutely phenomenal and I really applaud them. I applaud the efforts of our SIR leadership, uh, the people on this call, Sue, Maureen, and and Parag for their tremendous dedication. I've learned a lot from each of them. And um, I, I can't begin to tell you in this mentorship thing how much I've learned from each person on this call. So thanks to all of you. So I think uh, I'd like to add also that um, leadership is, is, is in need in every, every opportunity you have, whether it's within your, as a fellowship, uh, within your fellowship, in your class, um, within your local practice. Uh, the society is in absolute uh, need of, uh, of individual leaders to run committees and, and work groups and opportunities for that are, are vast and they will come up and the, those of you who are on this webinar tonight uh, are here because you have an interest in this and their the specialty is um, is is a phenomenal one where, where we are hopeful to to find wonderful trainees to mentor into these these leadership positions. You're taking that leadership right now by running this panel, uh, attending this. Um, lead by example. It's going to start with small things um, at your local institution or your local environment and then allow that to, to grow. And if you have aspirations for something more, talk to people. Um, uh, look for sponsors. Uh, good leaders, um, good mentors will, will do that. Will not just mentor, but find opportunities to sponsor you and and I think Maureen touched on that. I think that's an important distinction between mentorship and sponsorship. And uh, but the opportunities are there. Uh, they're probably there right now in your local environment. You just either uh, are doing it now. As some of you are running this this webinar, uh, I would say as an example of. But others, there are, there are other opportunities to, to begin doing so. So so take that example as first step forward. And um, we look forward to having you um, working in the society, perhaps in in the capacities that many of us on the panel are currently. Mm -hmm. Good luck to everyone. Yeah. I wanted to echo what um, Prague and Jim said, and just thanks again for including me um, among such incredible, distinguished leaders uh, in this society. I think my one advice is, uh, you know, as an immigrant girl from Iran who, um, you know, has heard a lot of times, you know, oh, are you sure you want to do that? You know, like, you sure you want to do this? You sure you can handle that? Blah, blah, blah. 
is uh, whether you're a woman or a man or, you know, uh, whatever, whatever your socioeconomic race, gender may be, but, but to think big, you know, to think big, want big and, and just go for it and, you know, give it your best. Um, don't let anybody's uh, words or thoughts or their perception um, affect uh, what you ultimately want to accomplish because it is your life. And at the end, that's all you have. And I could tell you that being part of the society or being a leader um, in your own, you know, part of the world um, is extremely rewarding. Um, we can all talk about, you know, the time commitments and how thankless of a job it could be. But um, at the end of the day, it's extremely rewarding and uh, and it makes for a richer life, in my opinion. And for anybody who's listening, uh, feel free to connect with me if you want to talk about IR or uh, or anything else. Um, I'm always uh, just an email away. I, I would just really kind of add just a tidbit onto the very end of what we've discussed. And if if those on the phone weren't already convinced that IR is the best specialty out there, I hope this conversation has really demonstrated that that much more. Um, I can tell you from my professional experience and the and the people like me at other organizations who I often interact with, what we have here at SIR, particularly among you all, the residents, is truly unique. I think we are um, we're pushing boundaries, but we still have this connectedness. We are inspiring leaders that are still humble and want to and want to move people along as opposed to feel like they are forcing people. And, and it really is this amazing, amazing culture of IR that kind of brings us together. And, you know, tonight I think you heard all of us describe very, very different ways and different paths and different activities and different approaches to leadership. But there is a connectedness there. There is this connectedness and just really knowing that for anything that you want to do, there's an opportunity to make it bigger than yourself. And, um, you know, really it, it, it is your opportunity to, to seek. There's, there may not always be specific room at the table for you to do something, but there is always an opportunity to engage and always an opportunity for you to lead within the profession and certainly within SIR. And, and you know, just like Maureen said, please obviously feel free to contact me as well directly to, to, to seek some opportunities. But thank you so much to the residents and fellow section for, for putting these webinars on. This is really, truly amazing. Thank you so much to all of you. We really appreciate all of us, trainees. We appreciate that you're spending your time and effort uh, to mentor us in this webinar and at the same time on all the conferences and life. And we really appreciate all your efforts to invest in us. And um, I think Monica wants to say a few more things. Yeah, thank you to our panelists. Uh, we're deeply grateful for your time and for sharing your wisdom about so many topics with us. Um, I feel very inspired after tonight, um, after hearing all of you, um, all the people that I, I admire um, a lot. Um, definitely ready to continue preparing m and for tomorrow morning, Dr. Patel. <laughs> um, <laughs> with all Perfect. the webinars uh, in the leadership series, this webinar is also being recorded and it will be up in a few days on the RFS uh, YouTube channel. So, thank you, everyone, and have a great night. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.